Sing that, Brother Payne. That's good stuff over there. Second Timothy chapter one. Take your Bibles, turn over in the New Testament to the book of Second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter number one. Last night, as we were sitting in the arena, as a huge arena that they have uh, secured for this capital connection. I mean, there were several thousand people in the service last night, but <coughs> God brought this. This verse of scripture just, I don't know, it just uh, hit me hard. I know it by heart. Most of you know it by heart. You've not, it's not a new verse. But I just quickly grabbed a piece of paper and began to scribble down some thoughts that the Lord was giving me about this verse. And uh, I was able to get home this afternoon, Brother James and I, after we delivered the three uh, gifts to the lawmakers there at Capitol Hill. We were able to eat some lunch down uh, in the uh, cafeteria uh, with all the interns and office workers and lawmakers and a lot of Capital Connection preachers were there. We were able to get home uh, at a good hour early this afternoon. I was able to spend the bulk of the afternoon working on this message that God gave me last night. You know, I never cease to be amazed how God works. God knows what we need even before we need it, really. And he knows who's here tonight, and he knows what you need. Now, I don't know what everybody needs. I just know what God told me to preach. And so, if you will tonight, do yourself a favor and listen to this message as if it is a personal message from God to you. I assure you, it will help you. You might not need it tonight, but I promise you, you'll need it before long because we're going to deal with a subject that all of us struggle with. So if you'd stand with me, please, as we just read one verse. We're going to read one verse, our text verse tonight, and then we'll pray and you can be seated. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 7. The Bible says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I want to preach tonight on alternatives to fear. Alternatives to fear. Lord, help us tonight, I pray, as we preach your word. I pray that God's people would be stirred. I pray that, Lord, if there's anybody here tonight that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that tonight would be the night that they let go of whatever it is they're holding on to that's keeping them, Father, from knowing you and walking with you and experiencing your blessings in their life. I have your will away in the service, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Let's just take a couple of minutes and kind of summarize where we are in this verse. You have to be careful that you don't just take a verse out of the passage of Scripture, yank it out, and start running down the road with it. You kind of need to know who's talking, who they're talking to, and the context of the story. The context of this verse, verse number seven, is a letter from the Apostle Paul to a young preacher by the name of Timothy. Timothy he is a young pastor. He was a, a, a student of Paul's. He was saved under Paul's ministry. He grew up under Paul's ministry, was greatly um, uh, impressed and, and uh, moved by, uh, impressioned by the life and ministry of the apostle Paul. And so Paul wrote him two letters, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. And these two letters we call them pastoral epistles because they're dealing with the ministry. They're dealing specifically with a young pastor and all the things that are involved in the life of a pastor. And of course, those of you that are saved that are not pastors, you can still glean truth from these books. Great, great stuff in these books. But the context of this verse that we're gonna to use tonight is a letter to Timothy reminding this young pastor of his responsibilities. Because many times the challenges of ministry can be frightful. Whether it's a bus worker, a Sunday school teacher, uh, a song leader singing in the choir, singing a solo, knocking doors, inviting people to church, or staying behind the pulpit on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and preaching, the ministry can be frightening. And Paul was simply trying to encourage and motivate young Timothy to embrace the call of God on his life. In verse number six, the verse before, he's reminding him of his ordination when he said, put in remembrance, 
uh, that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. We know that Paul had an active role in helping uh, thrust Timothy into the ministry by placing his hands on him, which is a sign of confidence and just a, 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 a testimony of, of trust and belief in the call of God on this young man. He said, I want you to go out and I want you to do what God called you to do. That putting on of the hands, that ordination was the sanctioning, if you will, of the local church. And he's reminding him of that in verse number six. Verse number seven, he's talking to him about fear, which we're gonna look at tonight, mainly out of that verse. Uh, in verse number eight, he's reminding him not to be ashamed of his testimony because Paul at the time was writing him from prison. He had experienced suffering and difficulties and, uh, and hardships and he's writing this letter to Timothy from prison. He said, listen, uh, you need to be a partaker in verse number eight of the afflictions of the gospel. And he says in verse number nine, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling. So these verses here is just uh, some verses that Paul is using to bolster the confidence and the encouraging this young preacher, Timothy, and remind him of what God has called him to do. Timothy's entering into new territory and Paul's assuring him of God's presence. Anytime you try to do something new, uh, it's always a little bit scary. I like what one man said, never be afraid of trying something new. Remember, amateurs built the ark, professionals built the Titanic. And sometimes God might want you to do something that's never been done before, but that doesn't mean that it won't work, amen? And so uh, Paul is trying to encourage Timothy here uh, to, as he's embarking in this new area of life, uh, to, uh, to remind him in verse number seven that God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. A couple of things I want to point out by way of introduction. First of all, I want you to notice the source of fear. If you read our verse number seven, the Bible tells us that the fear that you may be experiencing in your heart or in your mind did not come from God. God hath not given us the spirit of fear. What was intended by God to be a defense mechanism, and there's a time for a healthy dose of fear, amen. Uh, but uh, it's been utilized by Satan uh, to control millions of people. And if you live in fear, it is not God's plan, it is not God's will. It did not come from God, that fear that is haunting you. That's right. So we see the source of fear, it's not from God. Secondly, we see the spirit of fear. That's what it says in our verse, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear. It's more than just fear. It has a spirit attached to it. It's spiritual warfare. Yes, sir. If you have a, a, a constant daily battle with the spirit of fear, that's more than just fear. That's spiritual warfare. That's satanic. Yes, sir. The word spirit in this verse means the disposition or influence which feels and governs the soul of someone. And so if you can be described as being governed by fear, influenced, filled with fear, that's the spirit of fear he's talking about there. Somebody pulls out in front of you and it makes your heart stop and your legs go weak. Well, that's fear. That's healthy. If a dog with big teeth is chasing you down the street, you better run, okay? That's a good time to have fear. But we're not talking about normal fear. We're not talking about the normal mechanisms of fear that God has given us for our survival or what have you. We're talking about somebody that lives in a perpetual state of fear. That is not of God. It is spiritual warfare. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. God hath not given us a spirit of fear. Somebody said the fear is one thing. To let it grab you by the tail and swing you around is another. That's right. And I know some people that's let fear grab them by the tail, swinging them around. I mean, there's literally hundreds of fears or phobias. They have a word now called phobia. So there's another word for fear. Hundreds of them. I was researching it this afternoon and they cover an unbelievable array of topics. I was talking to a guy the other day and uh, he said, I, I don't like clowns. Clowns aren't funny. They're, they scare me. And I said, well, really? I said, why is that? He said, I don't know. He said, I think it stems back to the time I went to the circus and a clown killed my daddy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but people are scared of everything these days. People are scared of everything these days. They have phobias for darkness, yeah. phobias for snakes, phobias for spiders. They have phobias for belly buttons and hair and doctors. I mean, there's hundreds of them. I can't pronounce them. They all just end with the word phobia. Really, really long word. People are scared of everything. 
I mean, I was reading, one of the things that I discovered and said that, that some people, it said people are more afraid of public speaking than they are of snakes. That's right. Yeah. That don't make any sense to me. Because I've never heard anybody say, look out, there's a podium. <laughs> I hate snakes. <laughs> but I can tell you what, many Christians are living with worse fears than these little isolated, silly phobias. I mean, there's Christians that have allowed Satan to build strongholds in their life, and their vain imaginations have produced such realistic events in their own mind that they live in a state of fear. Somebody described fear with the acronym F-E-A-R, standing for false evidence appearing real. Most of the things that people fear never happen. Never happen. And so we see the spirit of fear, the source of fear. Thirdly, we see the separation of fear. Fear has a separating attribute. Can I just, for just a second, keep your place right there. Back up with me to the first book in the Bible, Genesis chapter number three. Genesis chapter number three, and look at the first time we see fear mentioned in the Bible. There is a principle, if you study your Bible, there's a principle called first mention principle. It's not 100% foolproof, waterproof, but most of the time when you see a concept or a doctrine or a truth mentioned for the first time in the Bible, that sets a precedence and there's a consistent theme throughout the scripture that you can pretty much go back and look at that first mentioned principle and it sheds a lot of light on fear. And the first time we see the concept of fear is in Genesis chapter number three and Adam and Eve had sinned. They have eaten of the forbidden fruit that God specifically told them not to eat of. The Bible says that their eyes were open And the Bible says in verse number eight of chapter three, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called on Adam and said, where art thou? He said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. The first time we see fear mentioned in the Bible. The first time we see a person full of fear and afraid, they are running away from the presence of God because of their own disobedience and their sin. So tonight we can pretty much establish that this fear that Adam is experiencing in Genesis chapter number three did not come from God. It was a direct result of a separation from God. It was a direct result of their disobedience and their sin. Therefore, when God made himself known, God made himself present in their midst, they ran and hid because they were afraid. They were suddenly aware of their insufficiencies. They suddenly felt very vulnerable. They suddenly felt very guilty, which were emotions God never intended for them to have to deal with. So today, if you are plagued by the spirit of fear, mark it down, it didn't come from God because that fear is actually alienating you from the presence of God. We're not talking about a biblical godly fear. The Bible says the fear is the beginning of wisdom. We're not talking about a reverential fear of God. We're talking about a fear that would cause you to run and hide when God shows up to want to spend some time with you. I'm going to tell you something right now. There's no way a person can enjoy the right relationship that they should with God if they allow fear to govern them. And there's no way to deal with that fear, but first you've got to deal with that sin and that guilt that is causing that fear. All right? I mean, if you're going to get rid of that fear, you've got to get rid of what causes the fear. The fear is brought on by an inadequacy and a vulnerability and a, and, and a cognizance of the fact that you and I have fallen from where we're supposed to be and we're not where we ought to be. That was the first time fear is mentioned and the devil is still using our sins to drive a wedge between us and God. You'd be surprised how many people that don't even pray because they say, God's not gonna listen to me. God's not gonna hear me. You'd be surprised with people that don't go to church. They say, man, if I was going there, I've heard it over and over and over. Boy, if I was going to church, boy, lightning would strike. 
roof would fall in if I went to church. What is that? There's a fear there because they know they're not where they're supposed to be. Fear causes separation. They're living in bondage. They're living in an alienated state from God. I'm gonna tell you how to deal with that fear. First thing you need to do is accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior and let him save you by his grace. Let him birth you into his family. Let him deal with that guilt and that sin that you're carrying around. That'll be a good start on dealing with this fear problem. Remember when you was a child and you disobeyed your parents, you weren't really excited about them showing up, were you? How many of you, your mom would say, you wait till your daddy gets home. Oh, yeah. How many of you was excited about daddy coming home? That same fear is in the heart of every person that is not saved, that has never accepted Jesus Christ as their savior, and they're dealing with that fear on a daily level because they know they're not where they're supposed to be with God. All right, that's the introduction. Can I give you something? Can I give you something this evening? Three things that are alternatives. There are alternatives to fear, by the way. There are other ways you can live. There are other ways that you and I can enjoy our day and our weeks and our months and live our life without living in a complete, total state of fear haunted by a spirit of fear that is not from God. Here's what he told Timothy. Go back to our text. I'm gonna give you right straight out of the Bible. Here's what God said. God hath not given us the spirit of fear, number one, but of power. That's the first alternative. That is the first alternative to fear is power. Somebody said fear is a habit. So is self-pity, defeat, anxiety, despair, hopelessness, and resignation. You can eliminate all these negative habits with two simple resolves. I can and I will. Now hang on just a second. You say, preacher, are you preaching mind over matter? No, I'm not preaching mind over matter. Am I, are you preaching, are you preaching uh, uh, these positive thinking, power positive thinking? No, it is biblical, it is scriptural for those of us which have been saved by the grace of God to take God at his word and to take the promises of his word to heart and to be able to rest and rely on them as opposed to this spirit of fear. Can I give you just a couple of them that would help you deal with the spirit of fear? How about this verse, Romans 8, 37. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. No place in there for fear. What about Philippians 4, 13? Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. What about 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 4? He said, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. These are good verses to commit to memory. Yeah. Yeah. Hebrews 13, 5, for he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. God said, I'll never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Well, that's a good verse. That'll, that, that'll, make, you wanna, that'll make you wanna say, I can and I will. What about Hebrews 3.20? Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. That is God's power working in us and through us. It's an alternative to fear. Power. Because let's just be honest. If you're full of fear, you're saying I can't. It won't. It'll never. I can't see it happening. It's not gonna work. God's not gonna do it. God's not gonna answer this prayer. God's not, gonna, God's not gonna perform this miracle. God can't. It's not gonna happen. It might happen for somebody else, but not for me. That's not power, that's fear. Right, right. During World War II, a military governor met with General George Patton in Italy. He praised Patton highly for his courage and, and for his bravery, and General Patton said, Sir, I'm not a brave man. The truth is I'm an utter craven coward. I've never been within the sound of gunshot or in the sight of a battle in my whole life that I wasn't so scared I had sweat in the palms of my hands. Years later when Patton's autobiography came out, there was a line where Patton said, I learned very early in my life never to take counsel of my fears because your fears will tell you one thing and God and God's word will tell you something else. Apostle Paul realized that even when fear is present, when weakness and trembling is how you would describe yourself, that God can provide an alternative to fear. It's called power. 
a divine power that overrules and overrides any fear that you may be experiencing in your, in your soul. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter number two. This is what Paul said. Paul said, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Paul said, when I came to the church at Corinth and I was preaching, he said, my hands were trembling. I was feeling weak. I was feeling incapable. I was feeling unable. He said, but I want you to know, while I was dealing with that down on the inside, the power of God overruled and overrode that. And when you heard me preach, you didn't hear me preach. You saw and heard God preaching. There is an alternative to fear. It's called power. And we think about Paul, one of the greatest missionaries that ever lived. I mean, the Apostle Paul, Apostle born out of due season. He accomplished more in the last 30 years of his life than 100 preachers would, would ever accomplish. I mean, he, he wrote most of the New Testament, traveled all over Asia Minor on three separate missions trips, started churches, trained preachers, wrote letters. I mean, saw thousands of people saved. And yet, when he wrote to people, he asked them to please, he begged them to please pray for him to have boldness. Yes. Ephesians chapter number six, verse number 18 and 19 and 20, praying with all supplication in the spirit and praying for me, he said, I'm paraphrasing, paraphrase, you can read it when you get home. He said, pray for me that boldness, that I have boldness, and that utterance may be given unto me to make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul said, please, when you pray, pray for me, the apostle Paul, yeah. to have boldness. Amen. Wow. Amen. There is an alternative yeah. to fear, and it is power. Right. Amen. Amen. God's work done God's way yields God's blessings. We can do the work of God. We can live in victory. We can live in power. Yes. And trust me, it's a whole lot better alternative right. than living in fear. Not only do we see the power, but secondly, we see in our verse, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. Write this down. Not only is there an alternative of power, but there's an alternative of passion. Did you know that you can't love properly if you are motivated and controlled by fear? I heard about this little, uh, little boy one night. She said, he said, Mama, the lightning was flashing, the thunder was rolling. He said, Mommy, would you, would you sleep with me in my bed? She said, no, honey, I can't do that. said, I, I'd sleep in Daddy's room. Little boy got real quiet. And he said, Daddy's a big sissy. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I found out? I found out that when you're controlled by fear, it distorts and disables your ability to properly show love the love of God, the love of Christ. It is impossible to love the way God wants you to love if you're controlled by the spirit of fear. You cannot love your spouse the way God intended for you to love your spouse. If you're always afraid they're going to do something to you, they're going to hurt you, they're going to say something, they're going to leave you, they're going to divorce you, they're going to talk about you behind your back, they're going to run off and cheat on you. You can't love them the way you should. Is everybody still with me? I'm going to tell you one of the best examples of love was the Lord Jesus Christ when he put his hands like this and they put nails through them. And he said, I love you. And if you want to stab me with a spear, you can. I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to love you like this. I'm not going to love you with my arm. I'm not going to keep you at arm's length. I love you unconditionally. And true love might make you vulnerable, but I'm going to be honest with you, you can't love and fear at the same time. That's right. That's good. You can't love your children the way God intended you to love them if you're so fearful. You can't love your church. Right. If I were to ask for a show of hands, I'm not. If I were to ask for a show of hands, then how many of you have been hurt in church or been hurt by church people? If you've been to church more than two or three times, yeah. you'll raise your hand. But you can't love your church the way you should love your church if you come to church like this. That's right. That's and you won't let anybody near you. You won't let, you won't let God, nobody can help you, nobody can bless you because you got your wall up. 
You can't love other Christians the way you should. You can't love sinners the way you should if you're controlled by fear. Because you've got to overcome fear to be a soul winner. I ain't going to lie to you. It's a little bit scary walking up to somebody's door and knocking on it. Especially in Dundalk. Talking like I talk. You're not from around here, are you? They say, where are you from? I say, I'm from Dundalk. They say, you're a liar. You're not from Dundalk. It's a little bit scary. You don't know if they're going to have a dog or if they're going to be mad and cuss you out, slam the door. I mean, it's happened. There's a lot of people never go soul winning because of their fear. Is everybody okay? Never pass out a track because of fear. Brother John Wilkerson made a very neat statement last night. He said, you know who passes out tracks? People that carry them. <laughs> yeah. You got to overcome fear. Afraid they're going to laugh at you. Afraid they're going to say something about you. Afraid they're going to make fun of you. Afraid you're going to make a scene. Afraid you're going to make yourself look stupid. But at the same time, you have to overcome that fear by a love for sinners that's motivated by a selfless love, not thinking about yourself. I remember one time when I was a missionary in South Africa, I was standing on the street corner, passing out tracts, which I did all the time. For five and a half years, passed out hundreds of thousands of pieces of literature. And there was a couple of corners down there I would pick where everybody that would be working in the city would kind of just funnel down through a couple of streets down to the bus station. They'd get on those buses and go all over the townships. And I would stand down there, and I'd pass out tracks. of people just coming by by the dozens. For every person that I handed a track, 10 people walked by that didn't get one. You could pass out a stack of tracks like that in about five minutes. It was amazing. But I'd go down there and pass out tracks. I'd stand down there one day passing out tracks, and a man walked up to me and just started assaulting me. Started kicking me, hitting me with his knee. He put his hands inside my coat and reached his hands down on the sides of my, of my waist trying to see if I had anything, a phone or a, a wallet or whatever. Funny thing was, I always carried a gun. I had a 9 millimeter Parabellum that I always wore, always wore on my, on my left hip. But I always wore a coat over it so nobody could see it. It was legal. I had a permit to carry. And I pulled that truck up that day and clear as a bell, first time, only time it ever happened, the whole time I was there, Holy Ghost said, take your gun off. And I didn't even, it was so real, I didn't even argue. I just took my belt off, took my holster off, put it up under the seat, put my belt back on, grabbed a stack of tracks and stood on the street corner. And not 10 minutes after I got there, that man walked up to me and just stuck his hand all up inside my coat and feeling if I'd have had my gun on him, put his hand right on it. And... I just, I just pushed him. I pushed him. I said, go on, leave me alone. I just kept passing out tracks. He come back and did it some more. I mean, he's hitting me. He's pushing me. He's up in my face cussing, and he hits me with his knee a couple of times. I said, go on, leave me alone. He finally left. I just kept passing out tracks. And there was a man standing at the top of the corner, up a block up the road, very nice dressed African man. He come walking down to me. He said, can I ask you, what are you doing down here? I said, I'm passing out these tracks, these gospel tracks. He said, do you have to do it down here? Can't you go somewhere else? I said, well, this, this is where all the people are. <laughs> you know, I like to fish in a fishing hole. Where's fish, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. I said, I'm passing out tracks like thousands down here. He said, but it's dangerous. I said, I know, but these people are going to hell. Mm, amen. These people need the gospel. Yeah, yeah. they do. Yeah. And God let me go places the police wouldn't even go. I mean, I went places the police wouldn't go. I remember when I first got there and I went to the police station, I said, is it legal for me to carry a weapon? They said, if going where you're going, you need one. <laughs> that might be one reason why I never was as afraid as I probably would be. I'm just saying that sometimes to be a soul winner, sometimes to be a witness, sometimes to love sinners, you need something other than fear. You need passion. And that passion will override that fear and you'll get to the place where you won't think about what you, I mean, look at the apostle Paul. The man was beaten. He was, he was I, mean, I mean, he was stoned. He was in prison. Do you think he was worried about how it was gonna affect him? No, he was not. He said, God not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love. I wish I had the time to turn there, but I'm running out of time. 1 John 4, here's what the Bible says in 1 John 4, verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect, 
that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. Watch this, verse 18. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casteth out fear. So as Pastor Shifflett preaching the truth, when he says that you can't love like you should if you're being run and, and, and controlled by a spirit of fear, absolutely. The Bible says, perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. That's what the Bible says. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So there's an alternative to fear. Number one, it's power. Number two, it's passion. Number three, look at our text. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Perception. You know, a clear mind, a clear mind is a hundred times better than a spirit of fear. Yeah, right. Amen. Have you ever been so afraid you couldn't think? <laughs> Have you ever been so scared you couldn't even run? Yes. You felt like your legs were made out of concrete and you just stood there. You couldn't talk, you couldn't think, your mind went blank. That's not a good place to live. I've been that way a time or two. You've been that way a time or two. And an alternative to that fear is a sound mind. Now I looked it up. Here's what it means. Soundness of mind to moderation and self-control. Because when you are being run by a spirit of fear, you've got no control over your mind. You've got no control over your thoughts. And you've got no control over your emotions. You are being carried, swept away by fear. The devil loves it when you're that way. But that's not from God. Amen. Somebody needs this tonight. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Watch this, casting down imaginations. We're talking, about a, we're talking about a mind, a sound mind, a mind that is a demonstration of self-control. Here's what he said, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. Listen to that, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Taking the thoughts that don't belong, taking the thoughts that God's not pleased with, and literally the Bible says casting them out. You might have to do something that I have to do sometimes. Stop thinking about that. I say that to myself. Stacy, stop thinking. Just, just let it go. And get your mind. Now you say, I don't know if I can do that. Try it. Might save you some trips to the psychiatrist. It might save you some trips to the doctor. might save you some, some, uh, some pills. Yeah. Yes, sir. Amen. Right. might keep you from trying some drugs. Yeah. Right. Sir. Amen. Learn. If, now, if you're born again, you can do this. If you're not saved, you can't do this. That's right. You can't do this because you're doing it by yourself. You need the Lord to help you. Cast down every imagination, every thought that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity yeah. every thought to the obedience of Christ. That, that Bible tells me that I can control what I think about. Right. Have you ever felt like your mind got on something really depressing, really disturbing, really painful, as the word, the Bible used the word tormenting, something tormenting, and you felt like it was a hamster in one of those wheels and just kept going and 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 you couldn't get it to stop? Have you ever laid in the bed at night trying to go to sleep and you couldn't turn your mind off because you was fretting and worrying and you was filled with the spirit of fear? There are alternatives to that. It's a sound mind. I said, heard about a little boy named Johnny. He's five years old in the kitchen helping his mama. She said, Johnny, would you go in the pantry and get a can of tomato soup? He said, I don't want to go in there. It's dark. I'm scared of the dark. She said, go in there. Ain't nothing in there. It won't hurt you. She, he said, I don't want to go in there. She said, go and get the can of soup out of this pantry. He said, Jesus will be in there with you. Johnny went to the door and up the door and said, Jesus, would you hand me that can of tomato soup, please? <laughs> I think sometimes we forget the Lord is with us. There is an alternative to fear. It's the ability to control your thoughts. Let me give you some more Bible verses and I'm done. This is the sound mind that Paul is talking about in our text. When he's talking about God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And that word sound mind means moderation. 
and self-control. You know what a moderator is, don't you? That's the person that moderates the service. That's the person that moderates an event. They're in control. That's the mind he's talking about, the mind that is under control, not a mind that the devil can wreak havoc with and you can just run and get on a tangent and start imagining. Why do we always imagine the worst case scenario? Here's what he said in Philippians 4, 4 about the sound mind. Rejoice in the Lord always. These are beautiful verses. Rejoice in the Lord always. You know it's hard to worry and fret and rejoice at the same time. You cannot do it. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The moderation means self-control. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. God's watching. God's looking. God's there. Let your moderation be known. Now watch this. Be careful. That word careful means anxious. Just sitting around wringing your hands all the time. Oh, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. You wringing your hands ain't going to change a thing. Right. Amen. It's not going to change a thing. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Finally, brethren, Paul said, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Yes. You can choose what you think about. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Paul's talking to young Timothy. Here's what he said. He said, you're a young pastor. You're going to have, you're going to have some adventures in front of you. You're going to be preaching to people. They're going to be looking at you. You're going to have things happen. You're going to get hauled into court. You might get thrown into jail like Paul. You might get beaten. You might get hit with rods. You might be stoned with stones. There ain't no telling what you're going to go through in your ministry. He said, but I want you to understand something, Timothy. God hath not given you the spirit of fear. There are alternatives, and that is power and love and a sound mind. And you as a child of God tonight, according to this Bible, you can choose. You want to live in a spirit of fear? You can. It's not God's will, but if it's what you want to do, you can. Or you can turn it over to God, walk in his power, put that fear to rest, and love people the way God wants you to love them. And control the way you think in your mind. Because if you ever get in that rut in your mind, it's over. That's right. The devil can get you in it, but you've got to get out of it right. with God's help. Amen. Boy, I wish I, could, I wish I had about another hour to just share some stories about times when I have been, what I felt like I was at the end of my rope. Mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, I was done. I was done. I had no more gas in the tank. Brother Phil, and I get with God and say, God, you've got to help me because if something don't change, I'm done. I'm done. I've got, I've got nothing left. And you know what God did? Come on. God helped me. This is going to sound so simple. God helped me change the way I was thinking. That's right. Amen. Amen. I wasn't a different person. I was just in the wrong thought patterns. That's right. Amen. Good. Father, we ask you tonight, if you would speak to hearts.